welcome to the Thursday edition of DC Today. I actually just ran up to the room to record. I've been at a summit meeting here in Washington, DC. Uh, I spoke earlier in the afternoon and there's been a number of other speakers and sessions. We have a big dinner event tonight and then I am flying home tomorrow uh, back to California. Uh, but of course, did not want to leave you hanging. So I'm up here to record this podcast and video and bring you a couple daily market thoughts. The um, first thing I want to say, just as far as the market itself goes today, is the market w got up a, a couple hundred points and then went down, actually went negative at, at one point, And then it came all the way back by the end of the day. Um, I think, uh, let's see, no, we closed up 142 points. So uh, not all the way to its high of the day, but um, nevertheless, another triple digit move higher. I also want to call myself out on the bond volatility um, factor. I wrote, I believe it was two days ago, about how we've had um, a bond market rally, we've had high equity volatility, and then the thing that people are not really talking about is how incredibly high the volatility in the bond market's been. And then we have, since I wrote that, had two days in a row where you would think the bond market died, uh, just hasn't <laughs> moved at all. And so... Uh, so this is the life I chose, but bond volatility had been very high. And then I wrote about it. And now the last two days, it has not. Um, what else uh, in the world? I um, The FDIC's move to take some of this $123 billion they want to recuperate and ask the big banks to kind of pick up the cost, I think is a little odd, but um, I expect that they will end up. It's just that I don't want to say that the big banks are going to pay for it because they're not. They will pass on that cost to, to customers. It will be priced either through higher rates on, on money they lend or lower deposit rates on, on money that uh, customers deposit. Um, and, of course, other expenses or fees or cost, you know, little little things like that. But that is a, apparently where we're headed is to kind of have some of the um, successful um, banks cover the cost of the of the ones who implode. So that, I'm watching that carefully. I also watched a Senator Joe Manchin today. Um, it was the first thing I read when I woke up this morning was an op-ed uh, from Senator Joe Manchin in the Wall Street Journal expressing his regret for voting for the Inflation Reduction Act and saying how he felt like he's been hoodwinked by the president and others around the energy intentions and spending and debt reduction intentions. And because I'm in Washington, D.C., when I read it, I thought about trying to find him and have a little face-to-face -face conversation because it was just so surreal to me. But um, instead, I just drank coffee and worked. Uh, the senator, of uh, course, um, I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but I think that in terms of the impact of that bill on inflation, on spending, the idea that they were ever going to take any revenue generator and pay down debt with it, I would. I hope he didn't really think that. Um, that might make things worse for me personally. But the fact of the matter is that we are really in a logjam about getting some permitting uh, approvals through and concluding the major pipeline that runs through West Virginia that the senator wanted. And I want to transition that into some comments about the energy sector because I do believe that this speaks to the paradoxical bullish case. Um, the things that are being done to limit the building of new pipelines or permitting of new pipelines or limit the building of um, uh, expanding capacity for production are, uh, in fact, a case for um, bullish investment. The fact that it's capital constrained forces a higher expected rate of return on the capital that does go into the sector. The fact that it's supply constrained forces prices higher. Uh, the fact that um, the sentiment is so negative uh, in a contrarian sense ends up, you know, pushing risk premium higher. So all of these things, I think, are very unfortunate to the society, but um, not unfortunate to investors in the energy sector, as we have seen the last couple of years, and I believe we'll continue to see, uh, even though there will most certainly be peaks and valleys and stops and starts and things along the way. Um, nevertheless, I, I believe a lot of people unbeknownst to themselves are working 
to make the energy sector a more attractive space to be invested. So that's the bulk what I have here from Washington, D.C. Like I said, no real movement in the bond market. Uh, the worst performing sector today was financials, and it was the only negative sector. And it was down uh, about a quarter of a percent. And for the second day in a row, real estate was the top performing sector, up one and a quarter percent. And then you had the Dow, NASDAQ, and S&P each day up you know, somewhere in between 40 and 70 basis points, respectively. Two different Q&As again. So many um, uh, questions coming in to Ask David that I've been doubling up for a couple of weeks, and I'll continue doing that as long as questions are coming in. And if they settle down, I'll go back to one a day. I hope you're liking the new written DC Today. By new, all I mean is I just sit down and start typing, and whatever happens, happens. It's a, I enjoy writing it that way better. I hope you're enjoying reading it better. And uh, that's all I got. Thanks for listening to, watching, and reading the DC Today. It's a very fun, very important Dividend Cafe tomorrow, Friday. And then I will be coming back to uh, Newport Beach, California, where instead of this absolutely breathtakingly beautiful day in DC, which is just quintessential uh, spring weather in our nation's capital, I understand that uh, Newport is continuing to see record rainfall. It's been one of the rainiest uh, winters and now into the spring in Newport in history. So there you go. Thanks for uh, everything. We'll see you tomorrow at Dividend Cafe. Mm -hmm.